Turn and take one last look around at your life, at the life we humans have built over the past few thousand years. It is already gone. The granite columns of antiquity remain, though they crumble. Humanity, more vast in its numbers, remembers little of its past. This great upheaval we see today is how the epochs change. The long-term survival of the human species depends on how well mankind manages its competition with nature, with other species, and with itself. Human and natural history show that there are immutable rules of engagement which determine the success or failure of societies. These fundamentals embody the art of victory. As individuals and as societies, we either embrace this art or perish. Oceans nurtured the birth of living species which evolved to occupy the earth. The seething, transforming variety of plants, insects, reptiles, animals, birds and other organisms from the earliest life began the eternal and conflicting saga of simultaneous competition and mutual interdependence. Every day, every season, every generation since the dawn of life has seen the drama repeated as each species seeks to perpetuate itself. Some species failed and disappeared from the earth even though they had been masters for a time of their immediate environment. Some succeeded through sheer size and strength, but ultimately those which survived did so through their ability to adapt to changing circumstances. More species of life will come and go before this earth itself dies. Humanity was no different from other creatures in its quest for immortality when it eventually developed long after many other great species had emerged, triumphed and ultimately perished in the millions of years before man. Some branches of humanity also failed, and those lines perished. So the ultimate triumph of survival of human society is by no means guaranteed. Like the dinosaurs, humanity could disappear at the apparent peak of its evolution. And as with the battle for survival of so many species, the conflict is only partially with nature, with other species, or with changing environmental conditions, and more a battle with itself. Indeed, what dominates the psyche of humankind are the sagas of conflict and competition between human societies from the iconic tales of individual combat or symbolic competition between representatives of different societies in the form of sport or even ideas or commerce to the massive specter of armed warfare between entire societies. How these forms of conflict and competition are managed determines whether an individual society long survives down the years to a far greater degree than human competition with other species or even with organisms such as viruses. But how we manage our entire competition for the staples of life determines ultimately whether or not humanity survives at all. Within this process, the long-term survival of any society down the generations is its victory. How we, as individuals and as societies, achieve victory is a complex process governed by rules which have rarely, if ever, been committed into guidelines for success. These are the rules of survival, and they comprise the art of victory. I'm Gregory Copley, and in my work on strategic intelligence over the past four decades or more, I've attempted to understand the principles by which human societies survive in command of their own destinies. I called these lessons of history the art of victory. In this process, I captured 28 basic maxims which underpin how societies and even individuals and societies such as religions and corporations succeed and control the terms of their survival down the generations, defining language, culture, values and the logic of their success in the face of competition from other human societies and other aspects of nature. Over the next hour, we'll look at some of the principles by which great civilizations grew, prospered and in most cases ultimately were eclipsed and even how the same principles allow, for example, corporations to survive competition or how individual families can shape their own destinies and perpetuate their own dynasties. To understand what we must do to achieve victory, we must also understand what has led us to where we are today. Victory is infinitely more important than war and peace. 
without victory, victory over nature, victory over adversaries, victory over self, victory over ignorance, a society fades to extinction. Mankind can tolerate the uncertainties and costs of conflict, but without victory, there's no lasting peace or any real peace at all. No prosperity, no control over destiny, no guarantee of survival. Victory, at its essence, is the survival of the species. Victory is the goal of life, and therefore, ultimately, of the whole range of human emotions and skills. It is a genetic writ within the essence of each individual human being to survive, dominate, perpetuate, grow. Society's evolution into sophisticated, complex structures has made abstract some aspects of this natural life force, but all human progress derives from the visceral will to victory. Power, prosperity, justice, religion, sovereignty, and the perpetuation of the species all derive from the natural urge to victory about having not just the strength to survive, but to survive in command of one's own destiny. So victory is not just winning. Winning when viewed down the silent, windswept plains of history is tactical, a phenomenon which is by definition explosive, transitory, and ephemeral. Victory, however, is slow burning, overarching and transcendent. It's multi-generational. Victory then requires that goals be won or achieved on an ongoing basis. It's neither a permanent nor secure phenomenon. Society too often mistakes the process of conquest for victory itself. But victory is the sustained delivery of a complex pattern of successes over generations. To be victorious then implies the command of an epoch and the fundamental alteration of history. And this applies to family lines as well as to entire societies. We are in the eye of an historical hurricane, an age of global transformation. It is a pivotal time for humanity. The pace of change has been accelerating, not just in science and technology. Human numbers are surging and flooding into urban, mostly coastal populations. Like organisms at any level, increasing the population within a confined space generates activity, friction, heat. We cling to the known world, but we are also fixated by the promises and fears of the future. We have forgotten, however, that in the past, mankind was more aware of the tools of survival with which nature equipped us. Perhaps, before we discuss some of the 28 maxims of victory and how we can apply them going forward, we need to ask why, after tens of thousands of years of human history, we need now to review our status on this planet. That's what we will discuss next. Man, unique among species, uses complex technology to multiply his chances for survival. These tools enable with increasing certainty the existence of greater numbers of mankind in an environment which was once only capable of supporting far fewer people. Compounding population growth, the new globalization of communications, capital, and tools of human interaction have in the past decade or so created vast swaths of people disconnected from any sense of the past, motivated solely by the present and by immediate self-interest. This new society, beliefs, and very narrowly defined knowledge, technical knowledge, have replaced fundamental and historically based general knowledge and wisdom. Remember, we moved from an age of belief-dominated society to great progress through the ages of reason and enlightenment. And now we're moving back, in some senses, to an age of beliefs, only this time we're calling them opinions. This new society we've created has come to dominate the planet. It's embodied in modern urban society there is a price to pay for our success in concentrating so much wealth and hope in technology and cities. People flock to cities in larger and larger numbers, making these giant urban areas difficult to sustain and to keep stable. Because technology has in many respects replaced normal human interdependence, this new type of urban society begins to think very differently from rural society, something which political analysts are just beginning to comprehend. 
Essentially, urban and rural societies have different belief systems and priorities. They may as well be totally different nations. The great urban clusters are now behaving more like sovereign city-states than as components of balanced urban-rural societies. No wonder then that we see modern Western states begin to become polarized by the maelstrom of technological progress and population change. We've seen great change before, not in the same manner, not at the same speed, nor with the same mass, not with the same glittering technologies. But there are precedents and lessons on which we can rely as we enter a period where existing states, even major states such as the United States, are more divided than they've ever been. This is a period when divisiveness can make states fail, or at least become impotent and unproductive, paving the way for reversals which could take away the great scientific and economic gains we've built. We've also seen reversals before. The difference now is that we have more than six billion mouths to feed and we need more, not less, prosperity, food, tools and shelter. If we enter an age of great economic reversal, the inability to fund new scientific, medical and food, water and energy advances could see us all vulnerable to pandemics and to a decline in medical care, dramatically reversing lifespan expectancies. This could also reverse or pause the great rate of global population growth. The world has, since its creation, faced cyclic variations in climate from the extreme to the moderate. This is nature. And we know that even minor changes in temperature patterns in different ways in different parts of the world sometimes threaten coastal environments and island communities and the viability of life in, say, arid regions. In other areas, climate change brings benefits. What we're facing in historical terms today may be only marginal changes in climate, but they're changes which will have considerable political and social impact. They are, however, eminently within the grasp of mankind to address. How aware were the people of the lower Indus River Valley that their great civilization was threatened as the last ice age drew to an end around 12,000 years ago, long before Egypt's pyramids rose? By some 10,000 years ago, major cities of the lower Indus Valley were beneath the ocean. They've only been, in recent years, rediscovered beneath the Arabian Sea, causing us to rethink much of human history. Humanity transforms and adapts continually. It developed spoken language and moved from hunter-gatherer to agricultural societies as tools built one on another. Society was transformed with the explosion of literacy following the development in Western Europe of movable type in 1450, spurring a growth in knowledge and a growth in individual curiosity and self-confidence. The portability of knowledge caused by this development created new wealth and power. Those societies with widespread literacy and easily reproduced languages became prosperous and dominant. After World War II and the triumphant nations of the Allied West, a baby boom created a population bubble in the rich industrialized societies. This demographic trend skewed and indeed paralyzed the economic and political thinking of our present generation. What if once again, totally new reproductive patterns transform the shape of societies? China's one-child policy has already dramatically skewed the gender balance in the world's most populous nation, with as yet unknown but certainly significant consequences for the stability of China and the world within the next decade or two. The tectonic shifts in history, the discovery of agriculture and the end of the Ice Age and so on, affected everything from how wars were fought to who came to power to how societies became prosperous. Those societies and individuals which succeed do so by recognizing familiar paths through what appears to be an alien landscape of change. The laws of nature have not changed. We've gradually, throughout human development, discovered more and more of what nature has always held in store for us. We are, in fact, better prepared to face the strange new gifts of science and the chaos of mass human concentrations than were the humans who faced the onset of the last ice age. And yet their survival forms the very basis of the victory we share today. Some shifts are decided by nature, some by human action. 
We're now engaged in a shift, which is the result of the works of both nature and man, and these will have ramifications within the span of our own lifetimes for political stability in many countries. But the pace of change is accelerating. We are, in the short term, facing dramatic new developments in all aspects of life. We'll certainly see, just in the next decade, for example, great changes in military operations and weapons. Nuclear weapons delivered by ballistic missiles could well be rendered obsolete even within a couple of decades. In early 2007, we saw China make a new leap into space with an anti-satellite weapon. But that, in reality, was just a flashback to 1970s technology. What we will see emerging, because of nanotechnologies, among other things, is a totally new approach to the militarization of space. Space dominance is the world's challenge for the 21st century. Within the quest for space dominance, a permanent presence on the moon has strategic advantages. Ready access to lunar resources, like helium, to jumpstart Earth technologies and other factors, such as prestige and global leadership, are all bounty for the victor. But the balance of power is shifting. The United States, China and India are all looking at using lunar basing. Who will win? China has a compelling goal of being on the moon before the 2008 Beijing Olympics. That's the prestige part. But the Chinese program is embedded in the military and is based on 20 years' work on the Long March missile launch capability. China uses Russian equipment. And for the past seven years, Chinese astronauts have trained at Russia's Star City. The Chinese strategic plan is propelled by a population of 1.3 billion people, over four times that of the United States an investment of less than 1% of their gross national product. The Chinese also have a historic determination to succeed. But we'll also see changes over the coming decade or so in how we define sovereignty and what governments have to do to attract investment and indeed to retain the loyalty and focus of their populations. But over the coming decade, Wealth may create so much complacency, short-sightedness and self-absorption that we could see major conflicts occur which could have been avoided. So while our enormous impetus in science and technology and wealth generation may enable us to do many things, our actual wealth and new social shape as a largely urbanized world may make us a victim of our own success. We risk running again into an unstable and hostile period of history in which wars and internal political battles could undermine economic growth. Given the delicacy of the economic boom we see shifting now into places like China and India, an economic downturn in, say, the US could cause the Chinese and Indian economies to falter. That could put the entire global economy into a protracted recession, causing reductions in investment in medicine, science and fuels. The linear progress of the human condition population numbers, wealth, scientific progress, everything could falter and change. Next, we'll look at some of the maxims of the art of victory for managing our future. All we see around us is change. Globalization, which essentially became viral after the end of the Cold War, meant that old concepts of sovereignty began to be swept aside. The technologies which had been used to separate societies during the Cold War, the communications, the computerization, the means of travel and trade, the flow of ideas, the ability to amass and move capital, all came together explosively after 1990, after the Cold War, to unify humanity, to create essentially a globalized society. It was like a more dramatic version of the globalization which Genghis Khan created when his Mongol hordes swept aside everything, essentially, from the Pacific coast of China and into Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries. The post-Cold War and the Mongol globalizations destroyed entire cultures and decapitated leaderships and social hierarchies. After the Cold War, with top-down social and trust hierarchies destroyed or damaged, 
lateral communications embodied, for example, in the media, the internet, and pervasively globalized television distribution came to dominate. The old leadership structures, the hierarchies of societies, even currencies and value systems were undermined and in many parts of the world discredited, damaged, or destroyed. The result is confusion and anxiety and a loss of a sense of personal and social identity. We need to know the rules and priorities of survival and success in order to find our way through the massive change which will continue for some time into the future as we redefine a new age. Maxim One, victory is the principal goal of a society and the first responsibility of the state because only in victory is survival possible. Our sense of victory is really a fundamental belief in our right to survive as individuals and families and as societies. Our psyches interpret our absolute genetic need to survive as a right, and that right is articulated as what we feel to be justice. It's easy then to see how we intellectualize and institutionalize our system of laws as a result of our visceral survival instinct. We translate this survival instinct, this desire for victory, into all aspects of our life, including modern corporate life. The fight for survival between US automaker Chrysler and German automaker Daimler-Benz came to a head when they joined in 1998 in a merger of equals to create a global conglomerate with some $177 billion in sales in 2005 called Daimler-Chrysler. This merger of equals, however, was nothing of the sort. It was a takeover of Chrysler by Daimler-Benz. It was a fight for existence by both corporations. Both were in difficult circumstances. Both faced the reality that, absent some transforming catalyst, their best years were behind them, and they were now, in the 1990s, fighting for sustainability. Chrysler was the more desperate party in the merger, but it was Chrysler which really had the longer-term strengths and could have transformed the situation to its benefit. The reason why Daimler prevailed lay in psychological factors. In terms of leadership, will, and self-perception, Daimler had dominance. Essentially, Chrysler was an aging and in some senses sclerotic company, operating in a vibrant, flexible home marketplace. Daimler-Benz was a more vibrant and self-assured company, operating in a moribund and increasingly stifling economic system. The post-World War II economic miracle had led European and US companies into great indulgences. They made long-term commitments of hypothetical future wealth to pension funds and to locked-in labor management practices. While the commitments to these schemes were long-term and inflexible, the market and the realities of changing technologies were anything but constant. But while the situation was set in concrete in Germany, it was merely set in clay in the United States. Daimler's substantial wealth enabled it to act before German and European Union laws transformed it into an irrelevant relic of the past. The company found the right vehicle to escape the constraints of a calcified German social legislation. It acquired Chrysler. In essence, Daimler-Benz moved its financial center of gravity out of the German economic morass and into the US. But Chrysler rapidly began to lose its own corporate identity and corporate culture. It lost its ability to determine the strategic direction of its own life. In essence, not only Daimler-Benz, but much more of the German economy has in recent years outsourced itself to remain viable. So if nations and governments wish to survive, then they too need to fight to retain the loyalty of the instruments of success, such as people, corporations, and capital. Corporations, like major institutions, are societies within the larger society, the nation. Removing or damaging these institutions affects the continuity and strength of the society as a whole. So when British Prime Minister Tony Blair in 1999 dramatically changed the House of Lords to remove hereditary peers, he may have thought he was modernizing an ancient institution. In reality, however, he was thinking only of current politics and damaged one of the major planks of the British national construct the House of Parliament which represented continuity and the rural framework of the nation. In so doing, he made Britain more and more about one city, London, and diminished the balance which was essential to the long-term interests of the United Kingdom. Companies, like governments, 
like all of us, are being pushed by the possibilities offered by technology and the media to think very much in terms of immediate needs and desires. We have forgotten to think in the longer term and to think contextually. Churchill said that the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. And yet in business, we tend to look no further forward than the next quarterly report. In politics, no further forward than the next election. And in our personal lives, no further forward than the next vacation. And we never seem to look at all at our history, which means that we cannot understand the future. This is the peril of modern society. Victory then must look beyond immediate gratification. It must understand historical continuity and look to future generations because ultimately what drives us as humans, individually or collectively, is that we must ensure that our legacy endures. Maxim three, victory can be sustained and built only by the conscious articulation of grand strategy objectives, which must be compatible with and become part of the society's psyche. A grand strategy, to use the statecraft term, is more than just a plan. It's a living process entailing comprehension of the broad context affecting the selection of short, medium and long-term goals and the development of strategies, tactics, ethics and standards to achieve these goals, all within a multidimensional and constantly changing environment. Grand strategy is four-dimensional chess and it cannot revolve around a single leader or even a single generation. The great success of the United States lay to a far greater degree than is commonly appreciated in the creation of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. These documents embody the operating principles for the state with such forethought that they have enabled almost a quarter millennium of economic and strategic growth. These documents are the closest thing which the US has had to an enduring grand strategy. Their influence has been profound because they did not so narrowly define the scope of society that their tenets could be readily overtaken by history. These documents remain fresh today. Where the US has lost its way has been when it's allowed the principles laid out in these documents to be trammeled by short-term political fashions. The essence of civilizational leadership is the conscious awareness of the need for victory, the ability to define it in terms of broad as well as specific objectives, and the capacity to deliver those objectives in physical terms. Victory is civilization in its positive and negative forms. The Roman Empire, for example, expunged the enlightened aspects of many cultures, such as pre-Rabbinic Judaism and Egypt's Greco-Pharaonic society and the culture of Carthage, to ensure victory. And yet the civilization which resulted is the base from which the West went forward. So there is, along the path to the ultimate victory or vanquishment, much winning and losing of battles, even the winning and losing of wars. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte said that in warfare, the moral is to the physical as two is to one. In other words, psychological factors are twice as important as the physical. So it is at the strategic or civilizational level. Part of this is that prestige must also be planned for in grand strategy. If grand strategy defines victory through overarching national or transnational goals and milestones, then psychological strategy is the key implementing tool in the achievement of such victory. Next, we'll discuss, for example, the role which God and belief systems play in mankind's grasping for survival and victory, and how, on the other hand, complexity and abstraction have always been the glue which sustains victory. Western societies basking in their long victory believe that they live in an age of rational, secular enlightenment. And yet religion plays as vital a role for them in war, peace and development as ever it has throughout history. The wars of the 1990s and today are literally all inspired by religion and seemingly secular belief systems, not by economics or territory. And this trend will continue into the indefinite future. It's part of us. Quite apart from the preoccupation which the world now has with Muslim jihadism, for example, 
It was the subtle schisms within Christianity which inflamed the wars of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, with Western Christianity supporting Muslim extremists against Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Scratch at the surface of any of today's conflicts and differing belief systems become apparent. Even so, many in our culture of materialism remain unaware of the extent to which religious foundations impact even their own ethical positions and decision making. Maxim Six, no victory was ever begun or sustained without a belief system which was greater than the individual. However, reliance on belief alone without the balance of other strengths is the path to defeat. Belief in God, or in gods, or in something greater than human society represents an inherent natural order which has always been at the core of victory. This is what allows human societies to come together, not just for the conscious view of self-interest and survival, but also in the unifying subconscious belief in a higher or greater cause. Philosopher Gustav Le Bon in the late 19th century noted that the most redoubtable idols do not dwell in temples, nor the most despotic tyrants in palaces. Both the one and the other can be broken in an instant. But the invisible masters that reign in our innermost selves are safe from every effort at revolt and only yield to the slow wearing away of centuries. The reason we're so reluctant to abandon a belief in a higher being is because we have, in order to survive, recognized that life is more than just about ourselves. It requires something more than just numbers of human beings for us to survive. It takes cooperation, guided by the leadership of mutual and overarching goals and customs to create a society. And that means that the essential glue in society is something intangible, in the space between individuals. It's the intangible which motivates us and reminds us of the ethics and essential commandments required for humankind to become more than the sum of its parts. But societies are beginning to lose their cohesive nature, particularly in advanced technological countries where the links between individuals in a community are becoming essentially electronic and where the commandments no longer seem to apply. Society narrows into zones, pools of light, consisting of the immediate home and family, the immediate needs of survival. We're no longer seeing ourselves in partnership with our neighbors, but in competition. There is, as a result, a large part of Western society which begins to doubt itself. Modern society, isolated and divided, and despite its aggregate wealth and power, is easy prey for a cohesive, belief-based opponent to weaken or destroy. Remember Napoleon's maxim, the moral is to the physical as two is to one. Psychological factors are twice as important as physical factors. It applies not just to the battlefield, but to all of society. Historically, the path from religion to art and architecture and on to intellectual curiosity and civilization leads to the building of strength by a society, to victory. The instinct toward organization in the name of the moral or ethical structures which grow out of religion is indeed part of the impetus which can give victory to societies. The Iranian revolution of 1979 and global upheaval caused by end of Cold War once again allowed religion to become an important cause of war and nation building. The modern world had forgotten about religion as a factor in warfare. But the reality is that beliefs remain the most potent force in galvanizing mankind for war and peace. But this new period of religious confrontation and asymmetrical warfare is being fought with advanced technologies. This broke us away from almost two centuries of preoccupation with conventional symmetrical warfare, that is conflict between formal state structures we need to understand the modern factors, but we also need to look at what history can tell us about the fundamentals of what we are now calling asymmetrical warfare, as well as a new form of formal warfare which will emerge. But if a belief in God or some secular ideology represents the simplified or iconic rallying point for societies, then there's also something else the polar opposite of simplicity, which holds societies together and builds them into something solid. It's complexity. The average citizen of Rome at the height of the empire took for granted great technological marvels, complex patterns of social behavior and dress codes, laws and obligations, and instruments of power. 
this incredibly sophisticated structure caused outsiders to marvel, and it was this dense construct, like the interlacing sticks of a beaver's dam, which resisted for so long attempts to defeat it. When, in 1893, Italian forces attempted to conquer Ethiopia, which they believed had been given to them by the Congress of Berlin in 1878, they were resoundingly defeated at the Battle of Adwa. What the Italians failed to realize was that the Ethiopians under Emperor Menelik II had a complex and well-ordered society which provided incredible logistical support and flexibility to the army. Emperor Menelik represented some 2,500 years of Ethiopian history as a direct descendant of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And in using his enormous prestige and authority, he welded together some 60 different highly structured Ethiopian societies into the start of a modern nation. The very complexity of Ethiopian society meant that patterns of logistical support and manpower were available at Adawa to defeat the Italians, who really truly never studied their enemy. As a result, uh, Minilik and uh, later on, uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, my late grandfather, was able to take Ethiopia to the next stage, creating a modern nation state in the face of yet another Italian invasion and the beginning of World War II. But Ethiopia was never wealthy, so it was the prestige, tradition and values which built this new federation of many different cultures. And Prez Menelik and Haile Selassie truly put Ethiopia on the path to its victory. But the coup in 1974 destroyed all that. Now the Ethiopian people have to rebuild by looking at how their historical sense of culture and values can provide a strong underpinning to a unified modern society. In order to go forward, they have to understand that they have an enormously rich past and a culture which can absorb modernization while at the same time rebuilding the victory which had begun by the teamwork of some 60 different Ethiopian societies. In the 1980s, US President Ronald Reagan and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher decided that the Cold War with the Soviet Union needed to be won. They threw the entire weight of the Western economies into defeating Moscow. The Soviet Union's true weakness, its lack of interlocking and mutually supporting strengths compared with the layered resilience of Western market economies, became apparent and the Cold War was over. The USSR had many weapons, but an economy only the size of the Netherlands. Maxim 8. Organically evolved complexity defines and sustains victory. Mankind's ongoing pursuit of victory may be punctuated by sharp watersheds or military success or the granting of national independence, but true victory is achieved only in subsequent years through a society's successful embrace of what I'm terming abstraction. Abstraction enables the leveraging of assets, just as, for example, a spear enhanced early hunters by leveraging human strength to be able to deliver a weapon onto a target at a longer distance. The thrown rock or spear or the leverage of a stick into a hammer action may have been the first human movement into acquiring abstract strengths or strengths indirectly enhanced by the use of value-added leverage. The real distinction between successful and unsuccessful societies and states those which succeed embrace abstractions. The failures are those which cling to direct approaches to their economies, military doctrines, and social structures. Most sub-Saharan African states still labor along with cash economies, unable to fully extract and exploit the value of their asset bases through abstract forms of credit. By creating many social structures within a society, one structure to collect garbage, another to fight wars, another to build roads, for example, we also create a capability which is greater than the direct action of an individual. We've created a society based on abstract principles. And successful societies usually have more complex and layered sets of interlocking authorities and technologically enhanced tools than unsuccessful societies. Abstraction and complexity are not measurable in finite terms, which is why they've been so often overlooked as strategic factors. The first great task of King William I after he consolidated the conquest of England in 1066, was to take a census of all aspects of his new realm. The result was the Doomsday Book, commissioned in 1085. The documenting and valuing of the nation's asset and the Doomsday Book laid the foundation for Britain's and the West's subsequent thousand years of victory. 
At first, the quantification of a society merely enabled the most efficient use of the assets, which were obviously or directly available. Today, quantification and abstraction, in other words, the addition of psychological aspects, such as trust and value, go hand in hand to create strategic strength. Survival isn't easy. Every species implicitly understands that reality. But who can deny that survival is the most important function of every life? In order to survive as a species, we must have cooperative societies to command all of the factors which ensure survival. We must have access to food, which means that we must in some way have control of the territory to produce that food. Today we can do that to some degree by treaties and trade, but can we do it in times of crisis? The same applies to our need for energy. Once this merely meant the need for heat to survive the winters, now energy is vital to everything including food and water supply. We also must have access to a viable pool of potential partners for reproduction, which sounds straightforward until we realize that today, many of the great economic powers of the world are suffering from population decline, which in some instances is being compensated by an inflow of migrants. And this, of course, changes, often for the better, but not always, the strength and shape of society. In China, the one-child policy of recent decades has meant that male babies were favored so that by about 2021, there'll be more than 23 million young men in China who cannot find brides. Small shifts in policies and behavior can have a profound impact down the line. We have to ask ourselves whether we've seen for the moment the global population growth peak. Will we see a period of population decline worldwide? If so, what does this mean? And does it portend, as did the Black Plague after it shook Europe and Asia in the 13th century, that the surviving population will be economically better off? Or is our global economic growth predicated on population growth? Lifespan expectancies in the United States in the next 40 years are forecast to double the number of persons aged 65 and older, from 35 million in 2000 to 80 million by 2040. People will live longer as well. Health, wealth, education, and medical care of the baby boomers will swell up the number of centenarians. 21 million Americans over the age of 85 are projected by 2040. Similar increases hold true for Japan, Europe, and the rest of the developed world. Yet, despite this, I predict a reversal of this trend the post-boomer generation is surrounded by an overabundance of food, while modern technologies discourage physical activity. Space research tells us that the consequences of such reduced gravity-using activities lead to obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, along with balance, sleep, and emotional problems. We see these now at a much younger age. All have life-shortening consequences, which will affect population age patterns throughout the world. And of course, this prof has profound consequences for strategic planning. By being conscious of the eternally changing patterns of nature and human action, we have the opportunity to make choices for ourselves and our societies. What's surprising is that all of the 28 maxims for victory relate to how we think and how we as individuals behave based on our inner motivations and reflections. Not one of the maxims says that our future is in the hands of nature or other people. If nature or other people provide us challenges, then our thinking and our behavior determines whether or not we fight to ensure our survival. The pace and breathtaking scope of the global society we've created makes us forget that the answer to survival, victory, happiness, progress, literally everything lies within us. We alone will and can determine whether we as a species, a society, a family, or as an individual survive and achieve victory. None of us as individuals live much beyond our three score and ten years, but we each to varying degrees determine how much of us is perpetuated down the generations either by our bloodlines or by our achievements. In 1960, philosopher Eric Hoffer even pointed out how suicide terrorists were motivated out of despair over what they felt were the irretrievably ruined lives in their irretrievably ruined societies to take one last grasp towards immortality 
projecting themselves through an act of self-destructive theater to become larger than life, thus finding that sense of immortality when all else had failed them. But there are almost always ways other than suicide through which we can achieve mastery over our lives and the life of society. Terrorism and suicide theater are the acts of societies and individuals who feel that they and their bloodlines, their identities, and the meaning of their entire family's existence to that point are threatened with imminent demise. The art of victory deals with that kind of despair in maxims which refer both to the futility of terrorism and the vital need to comprehend and believe in our own personal and societal identities. That's why Maxim 11 reads, Terrorism is a tool for an imperiled society to use in order to avoid vanquishment and disintegration. It is not a war-winning weapon, nor is it a tool to gain or sustain victory. In the fight for victory, Terrorism can only be a weapon to stave off defeat, unless its target voluntarily surrenders. Of course, we're facing terrorism now on a large scale around the world, and to a certain extent, Western society is surrendering to it, largely because it doesn't understand it. But both the societies from which terrorism arises and the societies which terrorism targets hold the tool to suppressing the phenomenon by achieving confidence in who they are and that they will, as a nation or a group, survive. That's a factor which I call identity security, the subject of Maxim 10. Victory is achieved and sustained in direct proportion to the level of identity security of a society and its leaders. Nothing is more important than a strong sense of self-knowledge which creates self-confidence and the capability for self-reliance as well as for cooperation. The maxims of the art of victory stress that it's all up to us. As Maxim 23 says, Victory cannot be bought and sold. It can only be won. Nobody is going to hand you your own victory. You have to grasp it for yourself. Ultimately, as we move into an era of great complexity and challenge, the art of victory is meant to empower us to conquer the challenges we face. The art of victory gives a blueprint for strategists, leaders, and even managers to lead and succeed. When we understand the beauty of the flowering of humanity, it leaves us in wonderment of the past in which our ancestors built civilizations. But it should also leave us yearning for the future. The maxims of how mankind has achieved its position in nature are the keys of human learning to open for us the doors to the future of our choosing. This is only the beginning.